In all of your wildest daydreams back on Earth, you never would have imagined that the sight of blue, seven-foot-tall giant twins rushing towards you would have filled you with such an overwhelming sense of relief. Greep and Jope leap from their open sleigh as soon as you and Loki emerge from the cave, and you're shocked, but a little more pleased when he doesn't let go of your hand. The twins bow, and you peer about as the wind whips the snow from the rocky ground, wondering where the rest of the entourage is. Did no one else come to meet their king? Greep, yup. Let us set out for Utgard quickly. It looks as if another storm is brewing, and I have no desire to be caught out in it. Yes, sire. Greep hesitates a moment, then raises slightly from her bow. Though, if I may, I believe that there are things that would be better discussed outside of the palace walls. Is that so? Yes, sire. Well, it is a delicate matter, but... Out with it. Come on, mortal, before you freeze to death. Loki drags you over to the sleigh and hefts you into it, then leans against the railing. He looks relaxed, but you know that he isn't. Hellbindi? Or has Bylas divinely found the nerve to act against me? The sisters exchange a look. You're guessing that neither of them want to deal with bearing bad news to Loki and Illy. Group finally clears her throat and steps forward, her hands clasped behind her back. <clears throat> Prince Helblindy has been holding frequent conversation with some of King Lafay's other children, sire, as well as some of his lesser wives. They are not usually on such familiar terms, and so we thought it noteworthy. And what of the Queen Mother? She has not outwardly expressed any displeasure with your rule. Which of Lofi's children has had Blindy seemed particularly taken with since his return to Utgard? Loki frowns. You're shivering now that the wind is picking up, and when you whimper in discomfort, he turns back to the sleigh immediately. On second thought, tell me the rest on the road. They all join you in the sleigh. It's standing room only, as far as the giants are concerned, though you're able to hunker down in the back corner to escape some of the wind. Sometimes being tiny has its advantages. Greep takes the reins and the sleigh rockets off through the snow. Lafay's eldest daughter, sire, Fenya and Menya. They are full-blooded Rimthashar, and they have never cared much for Helblindi, as their cousin Angraboda has a feud with Lady Skadi. She calls over the howling of the hounds and the winds. Angraboda. That's the name you recognize, kinda. I have no stake in that feud. Her and Skadi both seem pretty terrible, and they both want to marry Loki, and they both hate humans. I met them only once, but I was warned to keep a wary eye for Lofi's sons. Nothing was said of daughters. You'd consider them a threat? We can only speculate, but... Well, their mother's son, Kari, is very easily influenced, and I have no doubt that they would like to see him in a position of greater prominence. Too many names. Jotunheim really needs a Facebook or something, so that you can keep up with all of these people. Then, you can't help but imagine the twins with an Instagram, and that almost makes you start laughing, despite the seriousness of the conversation. They'd be adorable. How many others? Perhaps a half dozen? Though you have only been gone for a very short time, sire, and many of Lafay's sons do not care for help, Lindy, to be perfectly frank. He did much to distance himself from them when King Lafay still lived. Very unwise of him. I'd imagine that he wishes he'd cultivated a more fervent group of advocates now. That may be, your majesty, but many support Prince Helblindy on his blood and his reputation alone. He is certainly strong and fearsome, and he was the heir to the throne for many centuries. If I may be so bold. Speak. I do not think that it would be wise to underestimate him. 
He does not like to lose. Loki laughs a harsh, rough sort of sound. <laughs> then perhaps we are unlike after all. For neither do I. When you arrive at the palace courtyard, a host of guards and courtiers are waiting to greet Loki, and you're honestly pretty impressed. Because even if they don't really like him, they're pretty darn good at faking some degree of enthusiasm. You don't really get to take in much of the scene before Greep hurries you off into the palace, though, and you feel a slight pang of loss as soon as Loki is out of sight. Oh, great. That's probably not a good sign. Loki's chambers have some new additions. A large pile of trunks and half-unpackaged baskets piled into the main room. What's all this? You ask, pulling back your hood. Oh, I had only just begun to sort through it all. You see, now that he is truly and undeniably king, all of the lords and ladies have begun to send him offerings. Now is the time to curry favor, you know, while his court is not yet settled. Did your family send him things too? You tug off your gloves and stuff them into one of your pockets, running your fingers across a bolt of cloth that looks unlike anything you've seen anyone wearing on Jotunheim. Maybe it's from Offworld? Maybe it's something only for kings? Yes, of course. Father and mother sent quite a bit of paper, actually. Hmm, wonder if I can get my hands on some of that. You've been itching to practice your runes, and Jotunheim isn't exactly blessed with an overabundance of spare office supplies. I'm gonna go change really quick, okay? The Asgardian clothes aren't really great for Jotunheim, believe it or not. Laughing, Greep waves you away. <laughs> Go on. Put on something sensible. In Loki's bedroom, you take a moment or two to silently mourn the loss of your pretty Asgardian dress, which you carefully fold and stow away in one of the wooden trunks that the twins had given you to store your quickly accumulating wardrobe. You're only moderately freezing at the moment, so you pull on a loose, thick tunic and leggings, then tug on a furry vest. So vogue. You really need to get Jotunheim on board with fashion magazines. You're pretty sure it would be spectacular, considering all the leather and metal and fur they seem to love. And the weapons and the whole bare skin is cool mentality. When you return to the main room, Greep has begun to unpack one of the large woven baskets. You notice she seems to get a little antsy when she's nervous, and you figure that she's probably worried about whatever her sister and Loki are currently getting up to. You're kind of worrying about the same thing. The fire is beckoning, and you head over to it, practically purring as you bask in the heat. Hey, do you want your Yggdrasil travel amulet back, now that we've made it back from Asgard? You should keep it on, Greep says, placing a stack of books on the desk. For truly, you are a traveler, even on Jotunheim, and- When she abruptly stops, you turn to find her staring, and that's when you realize that your current tunic doesn't have much of a collar. Damn. Loki, his timing as perfect as always, chooses that moment to return to his chambers with Jelp, and he freezes as soon as he steps in the room, looking like he'd probably like to turn and run. Kiraudidotim. He acknowledges, poised stiffly just inside the door. Greep takes a step backward. Like she's expecting you to spontaneously combust. I... You... Your Majesty... What have you done? Loki's eyes narrow. What have I done? Do you mean to suggest that I cannot do whatever I wish with my mortal girl? This is... This is cruel! Lady Scotty will not stand for this insult. She will demand her life. Even if she dares to demand it, she will not have it. Sister, tell him. Jelp is staring at you now too, her eyes wide. Majesty, forgive me, but my sister is right. 
This is not done. You've all but wedded her now. And with your promise of a betrothal to Lady Scotty and her father, to anger them would be folly, especially with Prince Elblindy eager to stir dissent. Loki's temper is building, and you edge towards him, slightly apprehensive. And what if I have? I am the king. I decide what is and is not done. Grief is on the verge of tears, and her hands clench at her sides. You doom the mortal, and you doom Jotunheim, just like your father. I thought you had more wisdom in you, Loki Lafay son. She turns and storms out of the chamber, and Jelp looks after her, slightly aghast, unsure of what to do. Majesty, please do not blame her, for she's only- Go after her. Jelp bows and hurries out the door. It seals behind her, and you're left standing there in awkward silence, bracing yourself against your own worry and the rolling boil of Loki's possessive anger. Loki? You can't be mad at her. She's just afraid and- You started this. He says. He closes his eyes for a moment, breathing deeply, and when he opens them again, his shoulders slump, defeated. You started this, and I've continued it, and she's right. Now we are both cursed. Your hands fall to your side. Don't, don't be like that. I need to go deal with my brother and my father's women. I cannot allow these whisperings to continue. If my brain begins with unrest, then it will crumble rapidly. I have no time to deal with this, mortal. Are you just going to try and ignore it? Again? Loki! There are bigger things at stake than your feelings. Or even mine. You will stay here, and by Valhalla you will ask those infernal twins of yours everything they know about these damned mate marks. I thought I wasn't supposed to talk about it. Are you being smart with me, pet? Maybe a little. But you did say... It's a little too late to exclude them from this mess of ours, isn't it? You'd best hope that they can keep quiet. I'd hate to have to kill them. He moves towards the door, and you grab a hold of his sleeve. How can you even say that? Because I understand what it takes to survive. Which is something you do well to learn quickly. Loki carefully pries your fingers from his arm, refusing to meet your eyes. Learn what you can, and try to avoid revealing anything that might be compromising. You are not to leave the room without an escort. <laughs> Why not just chain me to the bed then, sire? Oh, don't tempt me. Besides, this is no different than before. Nothing has changed. Then he's gone out the door, and you trudge over to the fire and collapse heavily onto one of the cushions, tears brimming in your eyes. Everything has changed, you think. Everything. And Loki knows it too. Jelp drags Greep back into the room not long after, and they're clearly both pretty upset. Greep stalks over to the fire and crouches in front of you, but she doesn't say anything. And your face heats up as you wilt under her accusing stare. Are you going to yell at me? You finally ask. You are in love with him! Your mouth falls open. That isn't exactly what you were expecting. What? The only sure way for you to survive now is for you to convince the king to return you to Midgard in Anga. And you will not do it because you are in love with him. I didn't choose to be here. I didn't just decide one day to hop on over to some hostile alien planet where I'd be a human pet. This isn't... He... He cares about me. Come, the both of you. Mortal, I believe that what my sister is attempting to convey is that... Grieb interrupts, taking hold of your shoulders. I am worried for you. 
Neither you nor the king seem to realize how the court will react to this. And by Valgamir, when Lady Scotty finds out, she will certainly cause an uproar if he does not give her satisfaction. He won't. Grape, he won't let her hurt me. Besides, it isn't like I'm an actual threat to her or anything. I don't see how this changes anything. It burns to say, but it's true, isn't it? No matter what you feel, no matter what Loki feels, you're still just the human pet. If Scotty wants to become his queen, it isn't like there's anything you can do to stop her. But he has wedded you in essence. Do you understand? Lady Scotty will not stand to be seen as a secondary wife to a mortal, even if he cannot elevate you in the court. Job says. You close your eyes, taking a deep, slow breath, trying to calm yourself. This is too damn much. It's like you can't even get a moment to collect your thoughts before the next disaster gets thrown in your face. So... We don't tell anyone, then. Everyone already thought he was sleeping with me, and that was apparently fine. And we aren't married. Greep groans. Ugh. Do not pretend that this is some sort of thing that can be hidden forever. The both of you are far too tumultuous. Your feelings are clear enough, and the kings are only thinly veiled. What exactly am I supposed to do, then? Job turns from the fire, chewing on her lip. Perhaps it would be best for the king to make this public. What? Consider it, sister. Everyone already thinks in Illy mad, and if he makes it clear that he has done this, then at least none will be able to say he is a coward, or that he's attempting to hide his ways from Lady Scotty. Chelp, I don't mean this to sound rude, but that sounds absolutely insane. I mean, if the not super popular king just walks in and starts flaunting the fact that he doesn't care about all these ancient traditions and sacred rites and everything, then won't everyone just rip him to shreds? But think, if he truly has brought the casket of ancient winters back with him, and if he makes it clear that he will make Lady Scotty his queen, then she will certainly stand with him. And if she acts as though she does not object to these indiscretions, then it will be difficult for anyone else in the court to use the subject against him. Or maybe she'll get one look at our necks and instantly skewer me. And honestly, from what I've seen so far, that seems more likely. It would be terribly bad luck. For you see, in Anga, it is the midwinter this week, and ill deeds now will follow for ten seasons, they say. Well, Scotty doesn't exactly strike me as the superstitious type. I am telling you, this may be the best way. Everyone will be so joyous about the return of the casket that they can hardly express too much displeasure over what he's done to you, mortal, and what you've been allowed to do to him. It will be brushed aside, you see? Just a royal indiscretion. But if Lady Scotty raises no complaint, in fact, if she stands to become queen of Jotunheim's second golden age, then she would likely want to please the king, and so she might even silence any gossiping herself. You are being far too optimistic. Sometimes, sister, I think that you dwell with your head in the clouds. Better than to keep it buried in the snow. They are bonded now, and that cannot be changed. It is up to us to shape what happens next. You cannot be so fatalistic. We can't say anything, though, unless the king says it's okay. You do know that, right? He'll lose his damn mind, and I don't want you two getting caught in the crossfire of... Well, in the middle of all this. Oh, I know. 
Job taps her finger to her chin for a moment, contemplative, and then her eyes narrow in determination. <sighs> Very well. I suppose I'd best go speak with the king. Sister, you will not dissuade me. Loki Lavison trusts us more than any others on Jotunheim, else he would not leave her with us. He will consider my words. I'm certain of it. And then, her sister still protesting, she hurries off, a fearsome glint in her eyes. Norns. Grieb mutters, dropping onto one of the cushions with a stricken look on her face. The world is truly going mad. What next? I don't know. I really don't know. There's a loud banging on the door, and she hauls herself to her feet and goes to answer it, looking like she'd much rather hide and pretend that no one's home. A servant steps into the room and nods slightly, ignoring you entirely. Lady Greep, your presence is requested in the court for the start of the midwinter feasting tonight, along with the king's pet. I had not planned to attend. Apologies, my lady, but the queen has sent me specifically to summon you. Sighing, Greep dismisses her. We will be there in due time. I'll have to find something for the mortal to wear. The servant scurries off, and when Greep turns back towards you, she looks like she's almost on the verge of tears. It seems that Queen Farbauti has begun to seek a match for me. Oh, Inanga, that damned storm giant has told me that he cares for me, and I do not know what to do. She covers her face with her hands, then her shoulders shaking as she silently sobs. Hey, it's... It's gonna be okay. You try to reassure her, hesitating as you begin to give her an awkward pat on the arm. That doesn't seem comforting enough, and so you throw caution out the window and wrap your arms around her, hugging her tightly. At first, she stiffens, but then she returns the embrace, nearly lifting you off your feet. My norns have brought you into my life, and they have brought me him, and now... I fear that I will lose you both. You pat her back, realizing only then that her despair is a potent, almost tangibly sour thing, though you don't really understand quite how you can tell. You inhale deeply, suddenly a little concerned by the immediate increase in the sensation. Oh my god. I, I think I'm smelling her feelings. Which you shouldn't be able to do, because that's just a Jotun thing. Pulling away from her slightly, you try to keep a pleasantly neutral expression on your face. You don't want her to freak out even more than she already is. Hey, Greep. Um, so this mate bond thing. I really think you need to ask someone how it works. <laughs> 